the Coaching Perspectives podcast. My name is Sue Stockdale, and today I'm speaking to Loshni Manakam, founding director of Iceberg Coaching and Thriving Farming Women. Loshni, who is originally from South Africa, lives in New Zealand on a dairy farm with 600 cows, along with her husband and three children. She was named Fonterra Dairy Women of the Year in 2018, a reward in recognition of a woman who has significantly contributed to the dairy industry with passion, drive, innovation and leadership. A former lawyer, Loshni transitioned from dairy farming to leadership coaching after receiving her coach certification in 2012. So welcome, Loshni. Oh, thank you very much, Sue. It's lovely to be here. Now, your background, Loshni, is really interesting in terms of how you ended up in New Zealand being responsible for milking, I understand, 600 cows and doing coaching. Tell us how it all came about. It's actually quite a short story because even though I was born in South Africa, I married a dairy farmer from New Zealand, and that's how I've ended up now living in a beautiful part of the world at the bottom of the South Island of New Zealand. How did you get into being trained, learning more about how to coach, and even thinking about who your market would be when you're in the south of New Zealand? Yes, yeah, so like I said, it was a pain point for me. It was a crossroads because when I was that farmer's wife that had given up a big part of her identity and married someone and taken on that whole industry and business. You know, 10 years later, it was a question of rediscovering who I was. What was my identity? What did I enjoy doing? Because I'd put all of that aside for quite a while because I chose to be the stay-at-home mum and the support of our farming business. And when I looked around me, I noticed there were a lot of other women that were very similar. So in a way, the market was already there. It was something that was very close to home. And I knew I wanted to work with farming women to help them to rediscover themselves and figure out what they wanted besides family and farming. And that's actually what led to coaching. And, you know, it was good old Dr. Google. And I'd been searching and searching and came across this term coaching, you know, back in 2011 in New Zealand, especially like you say, on a far, you know, from a farming background, it wasn't a very common concept. And so the market was something that drove me to find coaching. I already knew it was a pain point I wanted to try and help resolve. And then it was Googling coaching, doing a lot of research around the organizations that were out there training coaches. And it took me 18 months to build up my uh, self-confidence to actually go out and sign up to a coaching course because it cost a lot of money for someone who had, was used to not spending money on herself. And I spent a long time justifying that decision of, would I ever even get one client ever? So I imagine that you had to have a great deal of belief in yourself that you would get a return on that investment of learning about coaching. And I know that you are the recipient of the Fonterra Daily Women of the Year Award, which is a very prestigious award in New Zealand. Was there any benefit around gaining that award and the coaching that you were doing? Yeah, they're very much intertwined. In some ways, the award was a recognition of the work that I have been doing for the last five years with women in the farming sector in New Zealand. It's also brought me a lot more yeah, credibility and it's given me a platform to talk about the things that I'm passionate about. So they are very much intertwined. So I imagine then that when you have that belief that something will work out, opportunities come towards you that you can benefit from. Yeah, that is such a cliche, but it's so true, Sue, because, you know, sitting there before I started doing my coaching uh, training, like I said, I didn't know if I'd ever get a single client. And it is amazing once you yeah, take those first steps in and do something that doors open and suddenly it seems like there's a flood of people that are actually interested in finding a coach and I haven't had a problem ever filling my books. That's brilliant. And we're talking in this particular podcast around the theme of health and well-being, something that I would understand to be quite an issue for people in the dairy industry today. Why do you think that is, Loshni? I think some of the obvious reasons why it is an issue is that it is a very physically demanding occupation. But it's also the growing mental demands of being involved in a farming sector because there's so many things out of your control that are vital to your business, like the weather, you know, is so reliant on it, but there's nothing you can do about controlling it. Um, things like prices for your products and your commodities, you know, those things are completely out of your control. There's a lot of stress there, but there's also growing stress from public perception, 
environmental regulations. Um, you chuck in there that farmers live in quite often in rural isolated areas and don't get off farm a lot. There's a lot of contributing factors to why health and well-being can be an issue in the farming sector. It certainly sounds like there's a lot, a lot of potential challenges there. And in terms of the support that you offer to women in the dairy industry, tell us a bit about what sort of ways that you do that. What are the sort of issues that you come up against that they seek your help with? I love working with people that are looking to continue thriving before they sort of end up at the top of the cliff or at the bottom of the cliff. And I like working with people to help them get clarity around what is it that makes them thrive and also what are the obstacles that get in the way of thriving. So it's very much a focus on full wellness, even before health and wellness becomes an issue. So Loshni, in terms of people taking to coaching in the dairy industry, how is it received? Is it a difficult sell? I think in the beginning, when I started out in 2012, it was unknown and a little bit difficult. And I think what didn't help was me positioning myself as a life coach, because I think that made it um, more intimidating and too, I think people perceive that they would have to be really vulnerable. What has helped for um, people in the sector to start taking to coaching is what I've seen a lot of organizations and individuals do, which is attach coaching as a an integral part of leadership. So, you know, coaching has been attached to a lot of leadership programs in the dairy industry and positioned as yeah an incredibly useful tool for all leaders. And I think that's really helped the uptake because it's not being positioned as one of the hard skills that you have to have. And that's helped with a lot of men looking into coaching as part of the leadership toolbox. And women as well. I, I do find that with women, because I've also been a coach on a, lot, a number of leadership programs in New Zealand, even though I started off as the positioning as a life coach, I transitioned into more of a leadership and a professional development coach. And that's what's made it easy as well, that it's normally attracted women that want to grow their leadership skills and contribute in the industry. And they've been very open to looking at coaching as part of that. How do you measure the success of the coaching interventions that you have? It is a good question, and it's a it's a difficult thing to measure. I'd say on a personal level, on a one as a one to one coach, even though it's leadership coaching, I think most coaches will find that you always end up coming back to personal development, even if you start with professional development, because people are people. And I always try to do the sort of scaling. When we start, when I start a new relationship with a client, I always ask, you know, what are we dealing with? It could be something like confidence. And I like to always put a number to it. So where are you at today? I'm at three. Where would you like to be when we finish our sessions? I'd like to be at an eight. So the measuring, you know, on that level is there. And also, I think the measuring in terms of the impact on people's lives, because, I mean, like a lot of your listeners, a big reason why we are coaches is because we want to have a positive impact on people's lives. And so in in sort of a long term, the way of measuring it is to notice where the people are actually having positive changes to their lives. And sort of big picture in terms of an industry, what will be great to see is the culture of our industry changing, of the farming industry. So instead of us being all about farming and our family, and that's it, if we can start seeing in the next five years or 10 years that our culture is becoming a lot more open and positive and a lot more well-balanced, I think that will be a real indicator that coaching has played a part of that because obviously it's very multifaceted and there'll be lots of factors involved but yeah it is it's it's a challenging thing to be able to measure um, the impact. So perhaps could you paint us a picture of just where you live and work and the types of environments either where you meet your clients or how you connect with them so that we can get a sense of what it's like down there in the south of New Zealand. Yeah I literally live at the bottom of the world right so you can't get much further south than right at the bottom of the South Island of New Zealand. And we do live on a beautiful farm. And I love living here. And the answer to all the questions you just asked is technology. I love how technology has enabled me, has enabled all of us living rurally. And it's such a powerful tool for connection. So I do all my coaching either via, you know, online via Skype or Zoom or 
I actually prefer the phone. I love coaching over the phone. I know you lose the visual cues you can get from being able to see someone, but I think you gain a lot more when you are listening intently for emotion or pauses or, you know, those kind of things. I find that the most powerful way. So I can coach anyone around the country via telephone, or if they prefer, you know, we do it obviously over the computer and Skype or Zoom or something. That's lucky because it's enabling us to speak here today in this conversation too, isn't it? I was curious to think about what you have learned about you since becoming a coach. I think I've learned, I mean, it's more about coaching than me, but it's very hard to untie the two. But I've learned the power and the impact of just listening to someone. The impact I can have by creating a safe and non-judgmental space and create that space for someone else to get clear on their own thinking. I have learned how powerful that is. And it's a very interesting thing to learn, especially for someone like me who loves talking. And as you know, when you're a coach, most of the time, in theory, we're listening. Um, so it's been incredibly powerful to learn about the power of listening. So it's, it's almost the simplicity I'm hearing of that message about really being there and giving somebody their, your full attention is so powerful. Yes, I think the more and more that I coach, the more I learn that our lives are so busy and everyone's running around all the time doing you know multitasking and that people really value and appreciate an hour where they get to talk about themselves and their thoughts because very rarely are we getting that in life anymore, an uninterrupted hour that is dedicated to you. So yeah, that, that power of being, of being able to listen. I've learned a lot else. You know, I've learned a lot about my own personal development because it's been mirrored in my client's personal development. So it's been a, yeah, it's been an incredible journey of learning. So what do you do in that regard, Loshni, to keep improving yourself and your skills? It's mostly informals and it's definitely keeping updated with different coaching websites and uh, information online. I think, though, the most powerful thing on my sort of coaching learning journey has been, well, two things, really. One has been I learn every time I coach a client. I learn more about what went well and what didn't go well and paying attention to that, making sure that I actually create that discipline and practice around sort of reflecting and analyzing afterwards has been really key for me to learn what what does work and what doesn't work and it has helped me improve as a coach and the other part is that making sure that I employ a coach myself over the years I've had different coaches because it's easy to forget what it's like to be a client and it's easy to forget what it's like to be exploring your thinking in that space and I love doing that because I learn so much about learning to keep quiet <laughs> while the client's doing their own thinking. And sometimes, you know, the more professional we get and the more experience we get, it's harder to remember that beginning point. So that's been really good for me on my journey. But connection to other coaches as well is really good. And again, it's informal, but I find a lot of my learning does come from talking to other coaches and learning from their mistakes or their wins or their challenges and those kind of things. I do enjoy that kind of learning rather than formal sort of professional development. How do you see the the need for coaching or the focus that you have developing or changing into the future? You've talked about virtual online courses. Are there any other things that you see on the horizon that are important for people to be paying attention to in that industry? I think that the need for coaches will become clearer or I think more and more people in the farming industry will start using coaches. I, that's what I believe will happen. So it may still be the in-person and, you know, one-on-one -on -one kind of coaching because I have noticed that there are a lot of different coaches that are popping up in the sector. So it could be financial coaches or business coaches, but also um, health coaches and, you know, yeah, a whole variety of other coaches that are popping up. And I think that people are becoming more aware of the need to look outside themselves so that they can become better at self-leadership. Do you have any top tips or points that you think our listeners should pay attention to for their own health and well-being as coaches? I don't really like giving advice because I, I don't ever feel like I know, you know more than other people. But I think that one of the mottos that I live by 
that really helps me get clarity and stay optimistic and, you know, positive is I try to always anchor myself with the thought that, do you know, we only get one shot at this life. This is not a rehearsal. We don't get to come back and do over. And I think to myself, you know, almost on a daily basis, why not give this my best shot? So I think it's about creating an awareness and a focus and a clarity about what do you actually want out of life? What's your definition of a successful life? And it's kind of like that, you know, what would you like in your eulogy? Like looking ahead to the end of your life so you can look back. It really helps me stay focused on, well, I'm here and I want to contribute and I want to serve, but that I also want to do it in a way that is fun and healthy and sustainable and flexible. And so if I know what the end goal is, it helps me in my day to day or week to week, you know, activities and interactions because it keeps me focused on what I see as the prize. So even with clients, I always try to help them get clarity around what is the quality of life that you are giving yourself permission to achieve. And that question and that answer, I think, helps lead on to a whole lot of other things. Wow, that's a powerful thought to leave us with considering, Loshni. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been great talking to you. Oh, thank you very much, Sue. It's been a pleasure.